AGI truly means having an AI, having a system that can learn reason like a human, which implies that it can learn to be a cancer researcher, it can learn to be a programmer, it can learn to be an accountant, an auditor, and any of these things. And of course, it implies as well that it can be a computer scientist and it can help to improve its own design. And it will be a profound change to humanity. Welcome to AI, Government and the Future, a podcast by Corner Alliance. We explore the intersection of artificial intelligence, government and the future. We work with government to create results. We ignite your agency's mission by helping you to design and implement high impact and innovative federal programs in AI, broadband, cybersecurity, public safety and more. Being a government ally is at the core of all we do. Welcome back to AI Government in the Future. I'm your host, Max Romanek. Today, I'm thrilled to have Peter Voss join us. Peter is an innovator, serial entrepreneur, engineer, and scientist with over 20 years dedicated to the development of artificial general intelligence, AGI. As the CEO of iGo.ai, Peter has been a pioneering force in creating human-level AI designed to optimize human flourishing. His unique approach to AGI through an integrated cognitive architecture sets his work apart from traditional big data methods. Today, we will dive into the critical differences between narrow AI and AGI, exploring how AGI aims to overcome the limitations of current AI technologies and the transformative potential it holds for various industries. Peter will share his insights and vision for the future, shedding light on the exciting new possibilities and challenges ahead. Welcome to the podcast, Peter. Thank you. As a means of getting us started, can you take us back to the beginning of your journey in artificial intelligence? What initially sparked your interest in the field, and how did you come to focus specifically on the development of artificial general intelligence? So I started out as electronics engineer. I uh, had my own electronics company doing industrial electronics. Then I fell in love with software, and my company turned into a software company. So I developed a comprehensive ERP package that ended up being quite successful. We went from the garage to 400 people and did an IPO. So that was really exciting. But it's, it's really when I exited the company, I had the opportunity to kind of really think, what do I want to work on next? And the thing that occurred to me is that that software is really quite stupid. Software doesn't have common sense, it can't learn and so on. And, you know, I was very proud of our own software, but still, if the programmer didn't think of something, if I, I didn't think of something, we'd just crash or give you an error message or so. So really, that is kind of what I wanted to solve is how can we build software that can think and learn and reason the way humans do, that software that is intelligent. So I embarked on a five-year journey of deeply studying intelligence from all different aspects, from philosophy, epistemology, theory of knowledge, and all different aspects of philosophy, cognitive psychology, how children learn and how our intelligence differs from animal intelligence, what IQ tests measure, and also, of course, what had already been done in the field of AI. And at the end of the study, I came to the realization that the original dream of AI, the term AI was coined 69 years ago, and the original dream of AI was to build thinking machines, machines that can think and learn and reason like humans. And in fact, they thought they could crack this problem in a year or two, almost 70 years ago. Of course, it turned out to be much, 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 much harder. So what happened is the field of AI really turned into the field of narrow AI. And there's a huge difference there that, you know, narrow AI is solving one problem at a time, like solving chess, IBM's uh, world chess champion. And it's very different. We can elaborate on that. So I realized that we really wanted to get back to the original vision of AI. So I got together uh, with some other people who shared that sentiment in, in 2001. And three of us actually coined the term AGI, and we wrote a book on the topic at that point. So that's how I got onto this journey, and it's been my passion ever since. That's fantastic. What a journey. I would actually like to dig in, as you said, into the differences between narrow and AI and AGI. I think that that's a great distinction that, that our listeners would love to hear about. It is actually quite significant what the difference is. One would think that, you know, if you're just solving one problem at a time, if you solve lots of problems, well, maybe you have general intelligence. But it doesn't actually work that way because there's a big problem in that with narrow AI, it is really the programmer's intelligence, the external intelligence or the data scientist's intelligence that solves the problem. 
and basically how can we use computer algorithms and the, the, the power of computers to play chess or build a game, a system that can play Go. And it really is the external intelligence. So you're not building a system that has the intelligence itself to figure things out. Even with new deep learning systems, yes, the system can learn by playing zillions of games of Go to play Go, but it's still the external intelligence to set up the whole, you know, what kind of network you need, how you train it, and so on. So that's one problem that you're really not building general intelligence or learning a kind of human-like intelligence into a system. The other problem is that you always need a human in the loop. So when the system doesn't perform the way you want it to perform, I mean, let's take chess system. If you change the rules slightly, you know, you have to basically then go in and change the system. Whereas human intelligence, the system itself, we can ourselves learn to adapt to changing circumstances. So it's having the intelligence in the system and the system being able to autonomously by itself adapt to changing circumstances and learn new things. It's really interesting. Looking at in terms of like real world applications, how do you see AGI transforming industries that currently rely on narrow AI? I think I really have to talk a little bit more about what AGI entails because there's, I think, quite a bit of confusion these days. You know, you have people like Sam Altman who recently said, oh, we'll have AGI soon, but it's not going to be such a big deal. Now, that is a gross distortion of what AGI is. Other people say, I think quite correctly, the invention of AGI is going to be bigger than electricity. AGI truly means having an AI, having a system that can learn reason like a human, which implies that it can learn to be a cancer researcher, it can learn to be a programmer, it can learn to be an accountant and auditor and any of these things. And of course, it implies as well that it can be a computer scientist and it can help to improve its own design. And it will be a profound change to humanity. And I, I believe it will usher in an era of radical abundance and help human flourishing by dramatically reducing the costs of goods and services and by helping us solve a lot of problems that are too hard for humans to solve right now, like cancer. I mean, when I was a child, was cancer will be cured in 10 years. That was a long time ago. <laughs> and it's, it always seems to, it's a really, really hard problem as are other, other diseases. So we need more intelligence to apply to this. If you, you ha have one AGI trained up to be a PhD level cancer researcher, you can now make a million copies and you have a million PhD level cancer researchers chipping away at the problem. And they can communicate much better than humans because they don't have egos getting in the way and they can effectively share information. So it really is not an incremental change from narrow AI. It is a complete game changer in, in terms of what it is. Narrow AI has to have a human in the loop. The system can only do specifically what it was designed for or trained for. And as soon as things change or you want to put it into a different situation, the human has to, again, then retrain the system or reprogram it or tweak the prompts or whatever it may be. That sounds like you're, you're sort of getting at the difference between what I understand you're calling an integrative cognitive architecture versus that sort of big data training method. Could you elaborate a little bit more on some of the differences there? I think a good way to categorize different approaches to AGI or to AI is what DARPA calls the three waves of AI. DARPA a few years came out with a, this presentation. They talk about the three waves. And what they mean by that is the first wave is what we now call good old-fashioned AI, or those were really the sort of logic-based systems, expert systems, you know, Deep Blue, the chess champion would fall into that category. So the 80s and 90s and, and, and so on. That was the first wave. And of course, it suffered uh, from brittleness and you know, had limitations, you know, it, it could solve a bunch of problems, but really had quite a few limitations. And then the second wave really hit us about 12 years ago when people figured out how they could use massive amounts of data, massive amounts of computing power to get neural networks to do really interesting things. And, you know, then speech recognition, translation, image recognition became just so much better. And that's still the wave we are riding right now is basically the big data and now more recently generative AI, but there's still 
big data statistical. And I mean by big data, we mean really, really big data because the current GPT models are trained on 10 trillion pieces of information. I mean, it's a completely mind-boggling number of information taking, I believe, the latest one cost $200 million to train the latest model that was released. So that is huge data, but they actually do suffer some very severe limitations, you know, the hallucinations, the cost, of course, and they cannot learn in real time. They simply, you know, you cannot update the model incrementally in real time. That's a very significant limitation in just the sheer cost of it. They also don't know what they're saying. They don't know when they don't know something. They can't think about their own thinking. They don't have access to it. So they don't have metacognition. So that's the second wave we're currently riding. And what DARPA mean by the third wave is cognitive AI. So it's the approach of saying, okay, let's not start with, we've got a lot of data, we've got a lot of compute, what can we do with it? That's a hammer we've got, what nails can we find? It's a different approach. It basically says, we start with what does intelligence entail? What is really important in an intelligence, human-like intelligence? That's the starting point. And then to build a system that can do that. So it needs to be adaptive. It needs to have metacognition. And it needs to be much closer to our brain. It uses 20 watts to do what it can do not 20 gigawatts or whatever. And we learn language and reasoning with less than 2 million words that we've been exposed to, not 10 trillion. So you want a system that can learn incrementally and has metacognition and, and so on. So that is the third wave and, and a cognitive architecture approach. Then looking at that, what sort of milestones or indicators do you think would emerge that would convince you and the broader community that we are nearing that moment in time. So I am already convinced, and we are already convinced, our team, that is kind of the conclusion I came to 20 years ago, and we've built various prototypes. We've commercialized it and then focused back on development and commercialized again, and we now have a complete focus back on development. We really now want to get to full human-level AI. Now, what would convince outsiders of that this is the right approach? It's a tricky question because people really have to unlearn what they may know about AI. We have a whole generation of people who entered AI in the last 10 or 15 years, and to them, AI is big data, statistical approaches. They don't even know anything else. So having that cognitive perspective, most people in the field of AI don't have even have that background. You know, when you talk about concept formation or what is free will or what does metacognition entail? It's just not something they're comfortable with. You know, it's more like statistics, mathematics and computer science. So you really have to understand the theory and say, you know, start with first principles and say, to build an intelligent system, is it not reasonable that you should understand what's important in intelligence? And then you say, well, do we have an architecture that can do that, that can learn incrementally in real time? that can conceptualize, that has metacognition and so on. And then you can evaluate the system on that basis and say, yes, this looks like it's on the right track. My own curiosities then, what would be the difference between this sort of intelligence and sentience? So if we could use the word consciousness here, which, which is, you know, has a lot of sort of scary meaning, AI pioneer Marvin Minsky called it a suitcase word, where it has lots of meanings that you throw into a suitcase and you close the lid and then you put the label consciousness on it. But if we can just kind of separate it out between our experience of consciousness, which they call P consciousness, a phenomenal consciousness, which is how we experience it. And that's kind of really weird. How do we describe how what it feels like to experience reality, to experience our awareness, our being? That's pretty weird. So if we put that aside and say, what is important from a, an intelligence point of view of consciousness? And that is self-awareness. Now, once you use the word self-awareness, it's a lot less scary. It's easier to get a handle on it. Self-awareness basically means you are aware of yourself as an agent acting in the real world. You know, so if something happens in the real world, did you cause it or did somebody else cause it? And also, we are aware of our thought processes to a certain degree. Obviously, not totally, but to a certain degree, we are aware of our thought process. So if you look at consciousness as self-awareness, then it becomes clear that an AI 
will have to be self-aware for it to be intelligent. In fact, it's a byproduct of intelligence. It has to be self-aware. If it doesn't know the difference between what it caused in the world or that it is, in fact, a causal agent, you're thinking through, hey, if I do this, it'll have these consequences in the world. You have to have that kind of self-awareness to be truly intelligent. That's very interesting. We spend a bit of time on this podcast talking about sentient AI versus hyper-intelligent algorithms that are not sentient, but heavily reliant on those big data sets. And I would say consensus seems to be coming down to your point around narrow AI, really measuring the intelligence of the programmer and the trainer. Those are scarier almost than the Terminator Skynet sort of scenario that, that gets bandied about a lot because you're taking a nameless, faceless program and letting them be the arbiter of it, where at least a sentient algorithm, you could have a discourse with it and understand what's coming back to you, et cetera, et cetera. That's exactly right. On the other hand, the current systems aren't really smart enough to do real damage because they confabulate. But you're right, it is the programmer who decides. I mean, we're seeing that, of course, in with ChatGPT and the various things on how they constrain them to be politically correct or to be left or to be right. You know, you get Elon Musk who has one type of training and, you know, have open AI who have different training on it. And yes, absolutely, it's the data scientists and the program and the people in charge who decide how the system should behave. But yes, once we have self-awareness and we don't have these pre-trained systems, but rather systems that can figure things out themselves, they'll be much more consistent. And, and I think, you know, what Elon Musk is talking about, the most important thing he believes is that they discover the truth of things, the truth of the matter or a balanced view. And I think that's exactly what real AGI will do is it's inherently capable of very, very rational thought. And being able to really understand situations and say, well, yes, there's a spin of it and this bias and there's a spin and that bias, but these are the facts as we know them. That's amazing. I mean, it, it immediately makes me jump to, you know, the sort of regulatory regimen that most governments are thinking through at the moment. They're really designed around those narrow AI concepts. What areas do you think are going to be the most critical for government to be looking into to ensure ethical development as we move into potentially a more AGI sort of focus rather than the narrow? So inherently, I'm extremely skeptical of government regulation for a number of reasons. Well, I'm sure we'll talk more about it. I mean, regulatory capture and that they tend to be behind the curve and they don't really you know, understand it and special interests and all sorts of unintended consequences that you, you have. But I, I'd, I'd first like to talk a little bit about that having true AGI will actually help us make better decisions. Because think of it as having potentially everybody in the world having their own personal, personal assistant that can help them think things through clearly. A little bit like having an angel on your shoulder, you know, that voting for this politician is really not going to be good for you in the long run because, you know, it will not have the outcome that you expect. Maybe sending our troops to Afghanistan is not going to turn out to be such a good thing or to be able to think more clearly because humans make a lot of mistakes by making decisions emotionally with not enough knowledge. You know, we don't spend enough time gathering facts, whether it's true or false. So we tend to make decisions sort of emotionally with limited information and we're not very good at, at rational thought. I mean, it's like an evolutionary afterthought, our rationality. We're only just barely becoming rational <laughs> animals. So having this AI that can help us think things through and make better decisions, I think will inherently be a very positive force to limit a lot of negative things. So increased intelligence, I think, helps to foster better morality in a way. So it, it does strike me that any system with that degree of capability removes a lot of the mechanisms that the powerful like to use to try to maintain their power. And I, that's exactly where I think the rubber would meet the road in a regulatory regimen that generates the sort of skepticism that you were expressing earlier. In this environment, it seems to me that there would be a pretty intense outcry, both from potentially citizens who can see the benefit of this and want this, but then the power brokers that would really be trying to thwart it. How do you balance this out? Like, What sort of mechanisms do you think could be there to help maintain the innovation and not kill it, but also recognize that like this is going to be directly threatening to a lot of very powerful people? I think one of the interesting things is that ChatGPT has now given us a taste of AGI. It clearly isn't AGI, but it's given us a taste. You know, it seems, wow, this thing really, there seems to be 
something really interesting happening here. It seems to have you know some amazing cognitive capabilities. So I think from a hardware point of view, we are actually very close to a point where you can run an AGI on a very affordable computer. And in a few years, it can probably just run on your smartphone. What that also implies is that potentially everybody can have one. And there's no way it's not going to be, you need this big, you know, you don't need $7 trillion and new nuclear power stations and, and so on with the cognitive AI approach, with the incremental learning approach, the third wave of AI. So there are two things. A, I think there's very strong evidence you're not going to have like one big AI like you see in the movies, you know, like a worldwide AI. I think there's a bunch of technical arguments why that doesn't really make sense, that it's more powerful to have smaller AIs or AGIs collaborating and working together. So there's an open source movement. You can't prevent people, really. I mean, it's going to be almost impossible to prevent people having their own AGIs if it can run on their personal computer. And people also realize that, I mean, Europe is shooting itself in the foot. It looks like California is about to, to follow by putting draconian rules in and liability for AI development and just means it pushes it out to another part of the world or to another part of the U.S., it is going to be developed. I mean, the upside of it, the value of it is so enormous, it will be developed. But I think the good news is that individuals will be able to have AGI and it won't be limited to just people that can spend billions of dollars to have AI which is sort of closer where we are now, the big data approach. But once we go to cognitive AI, that's no longer going to be the case because you're now talking about uh, training a model will, might cost a few thousand dollars and not hundreds of millions. Looking at the European and Californian regulatory regimens, I mean, they're very concerned with privacy and surveillance and to some degree, you know, national security, those sorts of things. Where would AGI land on that? I mean, their concerns, I think, are not unfounded. I think there's a reasonable degree of paranoia that people have around what the effect of this is going to be on their lives. Where does AGI potentially alter that calculus? Well, isn't it a bit of a, a joke for government to talk about ensuring our privacy? Sure, but who then, if not them? If not government, then how? I'd rather have companies that have liability that you can sue than government, which you can't sue, and you don't know what they're doing. So that question of, if not government, then who? Well, yes, anybody but government. Government should not be able to have access to your stuff without a warrant, and clearly they do. So I think the whole privacy discussion is sort of upside down in a way. You know, there are already plenty of laws, common law, laws on the books that hold companies liable for what they do or what they don't do, what they should do. Now, of course, I wish there was more competition. And again, these AI rules undermine competition. You know, there's regulatory capture. I mean, you have Sam Altman going to the Senate, being grilled about AI safety and so on. And then at the end of the session, they say, please, please, Mr. Altman, can you please run a council for AI safety? Can you be in charge? I mean, is there a conflict of interest there maybe? So not having competition, I think, is, is really a bad thing. You really want companies to say, and we have a little bit of that where Apple is probably better in that regard, that they probably do care more about your, your privacy than other companies. So if you can really choose which company you deal with, which company is going to protect your privacy, and if you can run your personal assistant, as we call it, if you can run it on your own device, then that is the best protection of privacy in my mind. So I'm very curious and interested in digging into this. You know, we this is a, a podcast that's designed at government and the consultants that, that help supply that government. And I hear what you're saying around private sector having a, a set of protections. My experience of government is that there is no possibility that they're going to let this be turned over completely to the private sector to self-regulate. And that attempts at doing so with other things in the past have not gone terribly well. Government can take on the role of, they can try to incentivize additional research. And, and certainly there's dollars being spent in the U.S. to try to incentivize some of that research. But then the other mechanisms that they have available to them are transparency and then some of the control areas where they'll just limit certain behaviors. Do you think there's anything to the transparency side of the house? And if they're going to go that direction, what sort of things would we be wanting them to tell us so that we can make educated choices? 
in terms of transparency, I mean, the one thing that jumps to mind, which is which may be a small thing, but uh, I think is quite important, is I do believe that companies should always, and if the, if their product is AI, they should always be clear about what is AI and what is human. Again, there's probably common law already that would protect that. You know, I mean, it's basically misrepresentation. I honestly don't know how the fair use thing, you know, copyright, how that should be handled. It's really tricky. I'm personally more of the, of the mind of having stuff available, you know, making stuff available. I mean, that's sort of my own, let's move forward as humanity, let's share information and, and so on. Obviously, there's some limit to it, but it's a tricky subject, I think, intellectual property. Again, I come back to laws that are already on the book. I think that should be the role of government to make sure that companies actually don't misrepresent themselves. For example, that they you can be forced essentially into entering an agreement with Google or Apple or any, you know, open AI to use their service. And then they might retroactively say, hey, we decided to use all your data, even though, you know, when you signed up, we said you, we weren't going to use your data. But again, they are breaking the law if they do that in, in my mind. So I think if government was much stronger in actually enforcing rules like that to protect individuals, protect the consumer, I think that would be a good thing. So getting the new regulatory approach for artificial intelligence just being enforced the laws that you've already written, not necessarily creating new ones. Yeah, that's pretty much it, because I see almost entirely down, only downside for new laws for the number, regulatory capture, unintended consequences, basically just pushing it out of your jurisdiction, then not having the knowledge of his argument as well, then everything's going to be developed in China and India and Russia and the rest of the world. And we'll be helpless because we don't have equivalent technology to help protect us against it if, it, if it's used against us. I think we need to kind of go back and say, what are the problems we're actually trying to protect ourselves against? Because that's actually something I do want to talk about is we have this very unfortunate situation where we actually have a whole economy based on scaring people of AI. Hundreds of millions, probably a billion dollars have gone into these nonprofits that basically their existence is entirely based on scaring us and saying AI will kill us all or AGI will kill us all. And unless you give us money and then we'll save you from it somehow, maybe. Now, that industry has just grown. And of course, it's, it's a great racket. Now, they don't allow criticism into that. It's really very cult-like. Whenever you have people who say, look, your arguments actually don't make sense, or the premises that you're assuming don't actually make sense, they don't hold water, those people aren't getting funding, and they're not let into the debate. It's really very, very one-sided. So that is a big problem. We're getting this very one-sided view of what potentially AI risks are. And it's, you know, it's very easy to say, you know, privacy. Okay, what specifically is the problem that isn't worse than what government's already doing or what we've already been accepting ourselves for decades being on the internet? So let's be specific of what the dangers are that we're actually talking about. AI taking over the world. Okay, let's talk about that. Privacy, what specifically are we worried about? Intellectual property, as I say, somebody needs to obviously somehow need to decide what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable. But it's already going into the courts to try and decide that with artists and movie companies suing open AI and so on. So, you know, let's see what they come up with and where they draw the line. And certainly I would say privacy is a greater concern with a narrow AI that's being trained on big data because that's data that's got to come from somewhere, they've got to train on it. If the AGIs learn differently and doesn't require such a treasure trove of data in order to be brought up to speed, that mitigates some of the, the privacy concerns there because you're not needing to go access years and years of specific transactions and conversations people have had so that you can get there differently. I don't know to what extent that is really happening, though. I mean, that breaches of privacy. I mean, people will find the odd, odd example here and there, but it's ultimately information that's out on the internet. I don't even think it's breaches. I think it's terms of service and people want these things and the old adage on the internet, if you're not paying for the product, then the product is you. That's true. So, you know, to me, it's a, a, important before you jump into trying to regulate something is to find well, what are you actually trying to safeguard against? What are you actually trying to prevent? Is that reasonable? And then is the cure going to be worse than the disease? 
And I certainly appreciate your perspective on the best regulatory regimen out there is enforce the laws that you've already written. And then I think it's a matter of just figuring out which agencies have jurisdiction over which issues that need to be enforced. That is a much more tangible problem that I think government lawmakers would be able to figure out rather than the amorphous nebulous what is the silver bullet that's going to make all of the balancing act work out perfectly for everybody, which is a fool's errand for sure. As you've pointed out, the one recommendation I would certainly make is let's get to real AGI sooner rather than later, that we don't have this big data, that we actually have systems that can be trained on curated data, on much more accurate data, and the system can actually think through of what makes sense and what doesn't make sense, what is private, what isn't private. And that's actually why we call it a personal, personal assistant. Actually, personal, personal, personal assistant, that the idea is that the first personal is you own it, it serves your agenda, not some mega corporations. You pay for it, but it then serves your agenda. And the second personal is that it's hyper-personalized to you. It learns interactively. It learns what your preference are, your history, the people you hang out with, and so on. Mm -hmm. And the third personal is that you control the privacy issues you know, of what you want to share with whom basically telling the system. So that is my vision, which I think would actually address a lot of the, the concerns for people to have these personal, personal, personal assistance. There's a few movies that seem to operate somewhat hinting at, at something like that, you know, like Her and some of those movies that give you a very personal AI, develop a relationship, and people fall in love with that AI, try to have like an actual humanitarian relationship with it. Is that a training mechanism? Like they train by forming a relationship. First, they become friendly. By interacting with you, yeah. I mean, my own view is that it's hopefully not something that too many people will end up falling in love with. Hopefully they'll find other humans. But certainly that personal AI can be a very, very good psychologist and help you to get through things. You know, it will probably tell you, hey, get out there and meet some people. Get out to the real world. Don't spend all your time with me. So you would hope that to do that. Now, of course, all of the Hollywood movies, again, feed into this fear of AI. AI is always the bad guy. One of the big producers, I consulted for, for one of the big producers on an AI film quite a few years ago and read the script and I gave some advice on what seemed reasonable and what didn't seem reasonable. But I couldn't help myself but say, well, couldn't you change the story that the ending, the AIs and humans actually work together and that AI actually helps humans? And of course, there was no interest in that <laughs> at all. The AIs have to be the bad guys. So that kind of in our consciousness now that that's the AIs will kill us. One of the mechanisms that we use trying to go after narrow AI, big data, non-sentient algorithm versus what this conversation is more focused on is sort of the way that we've tried to help unpack some of that on this podcast to demystify some of it and at least get down to ground truth of like, what are we actually talking about here and, and what of this is, is fear-mongering? So I, I certainly appreciate that perspective. I guess the one question I have outstanding then is, I totally understand how your personal, personal, personal AI assistant would learn by interacting with you. Where does the rest of its context come from? Because if it only sees the world through your lens, that becomes super narrow. And it sounds like what you're describing has a much broader purview. So where does the rest of its background and information come from? One of the ways to look at that is if you think of sort of three concentric circles, and if the inner circle is maybe college graduate level of knowledge and intelligence, general knowledge, you know, but having studied philosophy, obviously being very good at reasoning, being able to find information, being able to assess information and see whether it's likely to be accurate or not. So it has all of those core skills of basically being a very rational and knowledgeable entity. That's sort of the inner layer. Then the next layer would be some kind of specialization. So if you're talking an industry, it might then learn to be a programmer or an accountant or whatever it might be, or a cancer researcher. So that's kind of the middle level. And for the personal, personal assistant, it would presumably be skills that are generally useful for a personal assistant like you're managing challenges and relationships and being somewhat of a psychologist, you know, having been able to help people with depression and, you know, help them reach their goals. Those would be kind of the, the skills. And then it's only that outer layer that is hyper-personalized to you where you train it, but it already has all of that knowledge. So it's not that you teaching it from scratch what your particular morals are or whatever. It will basically 
already be very competent in philosophy and you know having a very broad background and being able to reason well. I see. Okay. Fascinating concept. It sends one's mind reeling with, with possibilities for sure. I know that we're getting a little bit tight on time here. And so let me try to help wrap up our conversation with, with one final question to you here. I know that through the course of our, of our conversation, we've talked about, you know, sort of a wariness with government and policymakers. That said, many of them are our listeners. And if you had some words of wisdom to convey to them as they are facing these issues in their day to day, what sort of advice would you give them? First of all, they probably don't know about AGI and cognitive AI because at this stage, everybody is focused, all the money is going into big data statistical systems. And it sort of sucked all of the oxygen out of the air. So it's very difficult for people to be informed that there actually is a better way that AI will develop is the third wave of AI, cognitive AI. So I think that is one thing I would say. And the other thing is to be aware of what I mentioned earlier is that there's a very slanted view in terms of AI safety. All the money is going into people who basically are yelling fire. The other side isn't getting funded or barely getting funded. So it's very difficult to get a balanced view. You're only hearing that one side of the story. So if they can actively go out and try and find counter arguments, and, and, I, and I think, you know, one of the roles of the government, I think it has the money to potentially have debates or have forums or conferences or whatever, where they go out of their way to find people who may give a different perspective of what the dangers really are and what things look like. But you need to actively go out and look for them because there isn't money flowing into the other side of AI will actually be positive and the many of the arguments of AI risk are actually mistaken. Thank you very much for those very helpful words. I hope that our government audience will take that to heart and try to strive for that balanced perspective and really have all sides of the argument well represented. Peter, thank you so much for your time today. Any final words for our listeners? I'd be very happy to talk to people. It's not my day job to do it, but I'm very passionate about it. I do believe that AGI will be a tremendous benefit to humanity, both in terms of radical abundance and how it will reduce the cost of goods and services, help us with scientific research, the personal assistant that we have, and really boost human flourishing. So I'm passionate about that. And if you know, I'll certainly happy to talk to people and give a few more details of why I believe AI is really a benefit and a lot of the risks are overblown. Well, thank you very much for your wise words. And to the rest of our listeners, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. AI, government and the future is brought to you by Corner Alliance. To find out more about Corner Alliance and how we work with government to create results, visit our website at corneralliance.com and then make sure to search for AI Government Future in Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts or anywhere else podcasts are found and click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Corner Alliance, thanks for listening.